Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and welcome back to Ex Situ, Operation Wallace Ears online lecture series. This week I'm introducing you to Dr Jo Nunez-Mino, who I met out on the Opwell Research Project in Honduras in 2006. This was my first expedition with Operation Wallace Ear and I was there doing my dissertation research. And I've never told Jo this, but he had a huge influence on me pursuing a career in conservation. Joe was very kind, having to talks with me around the campfire, talking about what I was interested in and how I could pursue a career in conservation. So I'm really pleased to introduce you to Joe. Enjoy the lecture and come back and watch the rest of our series. Hi, my name's Joe, um, and I'm the Director of Communications and Fundraising at the Bat Conservation Trust. Um, uh, thanks for showing an interest in listening to this talk, and thanks to Opwall for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to cover um, is, and I'm going to try and be as, as brief as possible uh, and cram everything into half an hour. But uh, first, I'm going to give you a, a sort of quick overview of my career path so far, followed by um, just some of the jobs that I've done during that career path, and then focusing on the work that I currently do at the Bat Conservation Trust. Um, I will sort of give a very brief overview about bats and UK bats in particular and what's unique about their um, conservation needs. Um, and then hopefully that will sort of frame what the, the work that we do as a charity. Um, if you haven't come across the Bat Conservation Trust, um, relatively small charity. Um, it's been around since 1991 and we cover a broad range of work um, at the national level although we do do some international collaborations as well most of our work is in the uk but more on that um, shortly so yeah my journey has been uh, quite long and um, not a direct one at all i spent many years working in it um, and during that period i was volunteering for various organizations uh, Plant Life, Woodland Trust, um, or oh, there's a few others that I spent a bit of time with um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so uh, about 2001, I was getting bored with my career in IT and I was loving my conservation work more and more. And I decided that it was time for a change and um, uh, change happened. Um, it, the big step that happened was in 2001, um, I went to Madagascar on my first ever expedition and it was very much about exploring a dream that I had about developing a career in conservation. I could see that the world was um, getting into trouble and that there was a lot more work that we could and should be doing um, to try and protect the world's wildlife and in turn protecting people. Um, and I went to Madagascar, wasn't sure what it was going to be like and absolutely loved it. I spent three, we three weeks uh, trekking through Madagascar with a bunch of friends and um, we just really had a great time and did some really great research in a very short period of time. And that inspired me or didn't, it, it confirmed what I knew already was that I wanted to develop a career in the conservation sector. So a couple of years after that, I um, came across Operation Wallacea and I was invited to go along and run one of the camps in Honduras, in Buenos Aires. And this is while I was doing a master's degree um, at Imperial College. Um, so I did my research at the same time as supervising a couple of undergraduate students who I think they're in the next slide, actually. Um, but yeah, I my my research then was was butterflies and looking at how butterfly diversity and abundance was affected by um, um, different habitat types and particularly with the coffee plantations around Buenos Aires village in Honduras. Um, made lots of really good friends, uh, most of which I still know to this day um, and I had a absolutely fantastic time, learned so much not just about how to do good science on the ground but about um, how to deal uh, with different situations, different challenges, how to communicate effectively with local villagers, um, how to manage teams, all really important skill sets that help you to get through the challenge that is conservation. Um, yeah. So after I finished my um, master's uh, project, I was um, invited to 
applied for a project that was part funded by a PhD project that was part funded by um, Operation Wallacea uh, based at the University of Oxford and I was successful in that application and I spent the next four years um, studying biodiversity across um, Kusuko National Park, Cloud Forest Park. My main focus was dung beetles, but I also worked across all the teams. So I looked at some of the bird data, some of the tree data. Um, again, really interesting, challenging and fruitful um, process. I think the thing that I most took out of that was how difficult it was to communicate really complex ecological findings um, to a much wider range of stakeholders and audiences than, than I had ever imagined. So the way that you speak to somebody who is in policy is completely different to the way you talk to a village elder, um, for example. So it was a really useful time for me to spend that much time embedded in communities and working with politicians and politics, um, which is a challenge that you just don't get from simply doing a university course. You have to get out there and actually do this stuff on the ground and, and see what works and what doesn't work and become a bit more resilient to it. Um, yeah, after I left, um, after I finished my PhD and um, stopped working in Kusuko National Park, I ended up in Dominican Republic working for the Last Survivors Project, which was run by Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust and the Zoological Society of London. And I lived in Dominican Republic for three years, uh, researching two mammal species, one called a Selenodon, which is a venomous mammal. Um, and the other one is a hutia, which is an arboreal rodent. Um, they're both the last um, mammal species, native mammal species um, left in Dominican Republic. And um, the, the work consisted a lot of field work. So going out to really remote bits of the island, even though Dominican Republic is known as a holiday destination, it's actually um, full of really remote places up in the mountains. Um, and spending weeks at a time sort of going through these remote areas and trying to find one or both of these species and also doing habitat mapping and um, at the same time having conversations with villagers with park rangers with a whole range of people that might come across um, either of these two elusive species um, a lot of the work was also outreach, so and that was at all levels from, again, doing village talks um, through to running. Um, this is a photography exhibition is the photo that I'm showing you at the moment, um, but art exhibitions as well, having um, events, uh, organising all sorts of education campaigns. Um, it was a very much a very holistic approach to conservation, which is which is what's needed, really. Um, it was really successful, funnily enough. Um, not only did we raise the profile of these two species, we also found out an awful lot about their ecology and their distribution. And that fed into a um, conservation plan. And the really good bit that came out of it is that neither species were quite as rare as we had thought, um, which was very, very positive. It did pick up um, a lot of um, worrying signs of how quickly it could deteriorate, though. Um, deforestation was a big issue um, and also invasive species, primarily um, dogs that were being allowed to roam freely in the forests and would kill these two species. Um, we got onto the David Attenborough um, program. Um, um, he, had a, he had a program called Attenborough's Ark, where he selected a, a series of species that he would choose to save, and he chose a Selenodon on the basis that it's a very unique species and one that, if it disappears, it would be very hard to replace. It's it's a, one of the ancient lineages of mammals. It's got a venomous bite, which is very unusual. And um, yeah, it was quite quite an honour to be on Attenborough's Ark. Um, the field work was was good fun. It was it was challenging. Um, very very long treks um, through very remote and um, topographically diverse. Uh, I mean, it was just it was just very very mountainous. Um, but I absolutely loved it. Um, we also came across lots of uh, 
different um, wildlife that some people are spider alert coming up. Um, one of my students woke up one morning to find this great big um, tarantula sitting on the outside of her mosquito net. Um, we didn't always sleep out in the field. Very often we slept um, in villagers' houses uh, where they invited us to do so. And it offered an opportunity both to integrate into local communities, find out more about what they knew about the species and actually have an interchange and, and sort of a, a chat around um, what their perceptions were and why we were doing the work that we're doing. That's something that I think quite often um, people in communities around conservation areas do find very interesting and fascinating. And very, it, it can be really fruitful from a conservation perspective. Um, holistic conservation really does need science. There's no question about that. Most of my work um, up until a few years ago was very much um, on the coal face doing the research, finding out about the species. But conservation needs more than just science. Um, you do need to educate, and I mean that at all sorts of levels. Um, yes, school kids are really important, and to empower adults to do that locally is much better than having somebody externally coming in and doing it, in my opinion. Well, that's been my experience. Um, I'd also say that you know, influencing policy is vital. In fact, after leaving Dominican Republic, I spent two years working for traffic. If you haven't come across traffic, do look them up. They work on uh, monitoring and um, basically taking action around wildlife tra trafficking. And I, I work with the timber trade section for them. Um, but yeah, policy is absolutely central. You can't have um, progress in terms of conservation without the appropriate policy. And that covers everything from conservation policy to things like trade and industry and the way that sustainability needs to be integrated more broadly. Um, but vitally important that um, all conservationists um, input into that process as much as they can. And implementing it is a really vital part of this. It's no good having the right legislation in place if then at the end of the day you don't get the, impl the implementation of that legislation. And that's something that I've come across in lots of different places um where where you have the policy but it's just not being implemented and that can be a real challenge in fact in many ways it's more challenging than implementing the policy itself and then empowerment i really can't rave enough about this but i've seen it working if you empower local people with the knowledge and the tools and the resources um, it can make a huge, huge impact. I've seen it time and time again, and I'm a firm believer that that's the way forward. Um, but you do need the whole holistic approach um, with all of these um, different parts, as well as solid science that backs up your actions. And obviously all of this needs constant reviewing, constant monitoring, and making sure that you're having the impact on the ground um, that you want. The future generation undoubtedly relies on us having this positive impact on what happens to wildlife and the environment. Um, it's easy to talk about the animals and how wonderful they are because they are, um, but it also needs to relate back to people and to communities and to their futures, um, because that's, that's, that's where we'll connect with a much wider audience than simply talking about the animals themselves. So yeah, I joined Black Conservation Trust uh, six years ago and um, it was a bit of a, a, a strange choice in as much as I now work um, primarily pure, or purely in communications and fundraising and I don't do research anymore. Um, I do miss it, but um, I also think that I also became aware that actually we need to raise the funds to make conservation happen. And very often conservation is framed in projects that are, or sorry, research is framed in projects that are three to five years long. And in fact, conservation works in much longer timescales than that. So it's vitally important that we get the right funding to back um, effective conservation action. Um, why bats? It's probably a question I get asked more often than not, and I'll come on to that in a second. But this is a picture, a photo of a greater mouse-eared bat, um, the last individual greater mouse-eared bat that we know of in the UK. Um, and although the species itself is quite common um, in mainland Europe, this is a, a, a roost 
of the same species um, we're down to this one individual here in the UK um, here we go the question about why bats I'll come back to the greater mouse in a bit I think um, I've always worked in misunderstood and unappreciated species so uh, Selenodon uh, which I mentioned earlier the venomous mammal um, quite unusual um, and mostly ignored uh, I worked on dung beetles which um, yeah, most people either have a blissful sort of ignorance about them or they find them a bit yucky because they, um, well, they eat, on, they eat dung. Um, but yeah, uh, bats fitted into the um, model, uh, misunderstood and un unappreciated. Um, they're very much, you know, play an integral part in environments right across the world. And they do a hell of a lot for us, uh, particularly in terms of, um, insect um, pest suppression but also in pollination and um, seed dispersal um, so they are vitally important as part of the overall ecosystem and they're found right across the world um, and it's funny enough that we don't know we still don't know very much even about some of the more common species that we know of even some of the common ones in the UK common pipistrel is the one that comes to mind um probably the most abundant mammal in the uk um but we still don't know where the majority of those individuals hibernate just as an example they really are absolutely amazing animals for all sorts of reasons um they are the only true flying mammal uh, group in the world um I, i'm going to say now it's really weird we, we always talk about just bats um, bats are an incredibly diverse group as i'll show you in a second so um there's 1400 species um and growing um so it, it, it's really important that when we although i'm making these huge generalizations we um i've recognized that each species is unique and uh, each species is special but so i am going to be talking about them in general terms yeah, the oldest bat fossil is 52 million years old. I think there's even one older than that now, but they've been around for an awfully long time. And yet they are incredibly diverse. I've, I'm just showing you two species here, the wrinkled face bats, um, which is found in Central South America and is a fruit feeder. Apparently the wrinkles are to let all the juices of the fruit go into its mouth. That, I, I'm not sure that's proven or not, but it makes sense. And then the painted bat, which you find in Asia, uh, a beautiful, uncharacteristic species in as much as it's incredibly colourful. Um, you do get a whole range of colours in, in bats, but um, yeah, that one's particularly striking. Um, so I'm going to focus on UK bats for the next few minutes. So we've got 18 native species. That includes the one greater mouse-eared bat. Um, we've got 70 species that actually breed in the UK. That's a quarter of all our mammal species. Um, globally, bats make up about 20% of all mammal species. Um, all, um, all of our species in the UK eat insects. Uh, a few of them all eat um, spiders as well. Probably nothing quite as big as that tarantula I showed you earlier, but yeah, they, they'll eat um, uh, spiders too. Um, about 70% of all bat species, um, folk, you know, they, they eat insects. Um, the others eat a range of things from other bats through to uh, pollen, um, nectar, uh, fruit. There's a whole range. There's, fishy, uh, there's fishing bats as well, for example, that will uh, catch fish out of the water. Um, yeah, so, but 70% of all the species are, are insect feeders. Um, all UK bats and their roosts are protected due to declines in the last century. And we've got good indications that this is beginning to have a positive effect on bat populations. And I'll touch on that in a moment, I think. Uh, where do bats feed? Well, different bats feed in different places. So again, I'm generalizing, but they need good foraging habitat and that varies from one species to another. Um, many will feed over water, some are woodland specialists, others um, focus on, on things like open grassland. The second rarest species in the UK, the great long-eared bat, um, there's only about a thousand individuals left. That one um, feeds over unimproved grasslands, um, just to give you an example. Urban gardens can provide good foraging for bats, um, especially if there's uh, a whole range of different flowering plants um, and if there's, there's things like if you've reduced artificial lighting, 
Um, the great thing about bats is actually you can see them in both rural and urban, urban settings, which means it can be a real nice way for getting people engaged with the environment and, and wildlife in their, in their patch. It's um, particularly since you have to use a bat detector, it just becomes a real um, it really inspires young people that have not come across wildlife in cities um, to, to sort of have to pay more attention to the um, natural world around them. Um, bats uh, also feed different bats roost in different places, but they all move around. No, no, none of our species stay in the same place throughout the year. They all move um, from uh, summer roosts to winter roosts as a bare minimum. Actually, they normally move more than that throughout the one season. So they'll have several places where they have um, maternity roosts, for example. Um, what's really interesting about working with bats is that they do they are closely associated with people um, so they they can roost in people's homes and buildings um, and, and that that causes some challenges but it also is a great opportunity um, to educate people about the importance of being able to share our space with wildlife um, there are some specialist species that will only roost in trees and bat boxes is something I always get asked about. They can work. Some species will use them. It really depends. There's lots of different variables that come into play as to what other roosting opportunities are around, whether bats um, uh, actually have the right conditions. For example, artificial lighting can be something that will put bat species off and not use an artificial bat roost. But yeah, um, some species will definitely use um, bat boxes. Quick uh, go through sort of a calendar of, of a bat. Um, they emerge from hibernation in March or April. Um, they start munching on as many insects as they possibly can. Sometimes during the day, oddly, we get lots of reports from people saying, oh, we've seen a bat during the day. Quite normal, um, it's particularly at that time of year when it's much colder in the evenings, less insects about. Um, they start putting on weight. Um, females will move into maternity roosts and they'll give birth late May, June, July time um, to normally uh, a single pup, um, occasionally twins. Um, bats uh, mate in autumn and the females store the sperm over winter and then impregnate themselves in the spring. Um, they do gain a lot of weight prior to hibernation so that they can survive hibernations. And um, I mean, the reason why they hibernate is pretty straightforward. Um, no insects about in the winter. So um, best thing is to, to sleep it out. It's not really sleep, but um, hibernate it out. Yeah, baby bats, like I said, one, one baby a year. Uh, the, bump, the, the young born naked and blind. Um, they take up an awful, they're about a quarter of the, of the mother's body weight. Um, they feed on milk as mammals. Um, they, females very often will carry the pups with them, attached to them as they fly around. Um, but the young themselves start flying around after about three weeks. In about six weeks, they become independent. The threats to bats are probably the same threats that you get for most wildlife, I'd say. Um, apart from possibly the first one, which is this, this misconception, there are three vampire bat species in the world and a lot of people just think of those three species when they think of bats because of all the horror movies and Dracula books and that sort of um, misinformation. That's been, not misinformation, but the people misunderstanding what the, the message is. Um, you know, our, bats really are our friends, but the, they do have this bad reputation, which is something that we are fighting all the time sort of trying to correct um yeah I, i've you know introduced um uh, animals like domestic cats can be a real problem not just in the uk but uh, across the world um in, in the uk we get an awful lot of reports about um bats being caught by cats um and you know they, they, they very often they don't kill them but the bite will cause an infection that will then um, kill the bats so we do always treat every um, bat injury as if it's about to, um, that it needs emergency um, looking after. Um, yeah, th th there's also this misconception around the legislation in the, in the sense that bat people think that, that somehow you can't touch your 
um, house if you've got a bat roost in it, and it's just simply not true. Um, but yeah, a lot of misconceptions around it. Uh, and this is just a, a, the artificial lighting issue is one that we are very aware of that can cause a, a serious impact on on which areas some bat species can uh, use. Some uh, species are more tolerant than others to things like artificial light, um, but generally speaking, it, it, it's it's um, something that's damaging to bat populations. Um, I could go into a lot of detail about how, but uh, yeah. It, 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 the research is pretty uh, it's confirmed that the artificial lighting has a, has a massive impact on on bats. Um, more a few of the mis misconceptions. Actually, this slide's really old. I've just realised um, there's more than 1,300 now. There's 1,400 species. But yeah, a lot of people don't realise just how diverse uh, bats are. Um, there's also the fact that you know that they're incredibly useful. I, mean, I touched on it earlier, but estimates for the U.S. alone, as they save um, U.S. agriculture 3.7 billion dollars a year on um, not using pesticides, which is an incredible um, thing. Um, the other role they play is the reforestation in tropical countries. Quite often, you'll get bats that travel long distances. The straw-coloured bat is, an, is a good example, uh, probably the largest mammal migration in the world. And as they go, they, they um, disperse seeds and allow forests to regenerate. So um, last few minutes, I'll try and really recap or, or go over what the Bat Conservation Trust does. Um, I mean, our, our sort of Catchphrase is yeah, we're working to secure the future of bats in our ever changing world, and that's very much the driver of all the work that we do. We have these three streams one is scientific, which is discover, so we need all that scientific evidence in place to support bat conservation. We need to then take action with that site with the science behind us to secure and enhance bat populations. And then we need to inspire as many people as possible to secure and enhance those bat populations. Um, we are a leading um, NGO. Um, we run several. Um, there's several departments within within Bat Conservation Trust. One is the National Bat Monitoring Program, which I'll touch in a minute, moment. Um, we also hand out advice either through the National Bat Helpline or through a range of other um, avenues, things like uh, newsletters. We have um, consultation groups with, with various key stakeholders, um, and that's that's a big part of the job that we do. And we also train professionals um, and volunteers um, on, on a whole range of, of um, uh, different skill sets that they need in order to do the research and the on the ground um, application conservation. Um, National Bat Monitoring Programme um, has been going for over 20 years now and it's citizen science. We monitor 11 out of the 18 species in the UK and um, we're showing those trends are showing stability, um, if not a little bit of increase for 11, the 11 species that we're able to monitor, um, which is really encouraging. It, it, it's a positive conservation story. It looks like a combination of conservation action and the legislation protecting bats is having an impact on the ground and it's something that should be celebrated and built upon. Um, it's definitely a, a, a something not you don't see very often in, in, in a, you know positive conservation story. The National Bat Helpline is um, a key part of what we do and it's basically offering advice to a range of um, audiences from house builders through to um individuals who happen to find a bat on in their back garden and everything in between um, we very much take a collaborative approach um we work with a whole range of bat carers and bat hospitals and we provide these guidelines um, that we update regularly we work on the policy front going back to what i mentioned earlier absolutely central to what we do is is going and talking to politicians and um, using good science and good communication to make sure that politicians are aware of why we need the protection and why action needs to be taken. And then we also work with a range of partners, um, Denby's uh, one yard, uh, vine yard in um, uh, oh, Kent um, is one that we've worked with in the past. Um, but we also work with, for example, local authorities to make sure that they have all the data they need to make the right planning 
decisions. Um, Back from the Brink is a great project that we're involved with, with um, eight other NGOs, and we're looking at the most, the rarest species in the UK, and we're working with the um, grey long-eared bat in particular, but also covering other bat species as well. Um, bat crime, so since um, bats are protected, bats and their roosts are protected, we work um, with wildlife crime officers and with members of the public. Um, when, when there's a wildlife crime being committed, we try and support um, the prosecution if necessary, but really the focus of our work is to try and avoid getting to that stage if at all possible. Bats and Churches is one of our key projects at the moment, and it's working with church communities that have large bat roosts in their um, church and finding sustainable solutions that work for the bats and for the church communities too. Really important, uh, really uh, uh, powerful work that's that's um, already beginning to bear fruit, even though it's um, only year one of that particular project. But it's very much using good science, good communication, good engagement to bring about change and solving that human wildlife um, conflict that that um, well, it's it's at the core of a lot of conservation problems. We produce a number of publications. These are our membership magazines, Bat News and Young Bat Worker, but we also do a lot of outreach, sort of downloadable leaflets, um, posters. This is one that we did a couple of years ago, How Trees Important to Bats, and it's just showing in a really simple way why trees matter to bats. Um, we also do some professional publications such as the Bat Survey um, Guidelines um, for Ecologists and also produce reports such as the bat crime annual report that comes out every year as well yeah outreach is absolutely central to what we do and a lot of it is more about supporting others to do outreach rather than doing it directly ourselves but we do as much as we can um, we also have quite a bit of impact on social media um, these these slides are way out of date i think we've got forty-five thousand followers on um, twitter and we've got about 115,000 on Facebook, and I think it's about 15,000 now on Instagram. It's a good way of reaching different audiences, wider audiences, urban audiences, which are often forgotten, um, but we, we, they're just as important with so many people living in cities. They're absolutely vital for us to get the message out there. Yeah, loads of people to thank. Um, yeah, my mum has uh, been instrumental in supporting me throughout um, my whole conservation career. My grandfather, who who inspired me in, in nature, even though I was born and raised in London, I'd go to Spain and my granddad would um, just, just uh, would take a walk through forests and, and it would just, um, is where my love of the natural world was born. Um, and uh, I am a huge um, debt of gratitude for, for that. Um, lots of people to thank, the photographers that have let me use their photos and everyone who supports Bat Conservation Trust. Um, I've worked with a great team of people. Um, I, you know, nobody does this sort of work by themselves. That's Schubert, by the way, who, who, who comes in, the dog is Schubert, who comes into the office occasionally to, to visit the Bat team. And yeah, happy to take any questions. Um, sorry, that feels like I've rushed it a bit. Um, hopefully it'll give you a broad overview of the work I've done and happy to receive questions on any of it. Um, thanks very much. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing some questions from you. Thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying our series. One of the reasons we wanted to create Ex Situ was to bring researchers right to your living room. So please don't forget that we have a live question and answer session with our presenters every single week where we ask them your questions. To get more details, check out www.opwold.com forward slash Ex Situ. And don't forget, if you're enjoying this, sign up so that you get notifications of when we have new lectures coming out and like and share this with anybody you think would be interested. Thanks again. See you next week.